One of the wonderful things about being a paleoanthropologist is the discipline is relatively new, and therefore we still have the potential to be very much surprised by what we find in the fossil record. This is true even in places where we've already worked for a long time. There's been work done in the Cradle of Humankind region of South Africa for almost 100 years, and yet just recently there was a discovery related to Australopithecine evolution which was very surprising. It comes to us from the site of Malapa, located in the Cradle of Humankind a valley that also holds such prominent sites as Sturkfontein and Swartkrans, caves that we've already talked about in the context of earlier Australopithecine evolution. And yet the site of Malapa was only discovered recently, and discovered accidentally, when Lee Berger, a professor who's been in South Africa for nearly 20 years, was walking through this region with his son, and happened to come upon an old limestone excavation. And within that limestone excavation, his son saw a block of matrix that appeared to have a bone sticking out of it. And indeed, that bone appeared to be a fossil, and not just any fossil, but a fossil of what now might be a new species of Australopithecine, what has been referred to in publications as Australopithecus sediba. And it turns out that fossil was just the beginning of perhaps another new, amazingly rich site from South Africa. Malapa, although excavations haven't actually begun at this site, they've only worked with surface material found on the surface of the limestone quarry, has produced abundant remains, representing at least two partial skeletons. Here you see reconstructions of those two skeletons, MH1 and MH2, flanking a reconstruction we saw earlier of Lucy, AL288-1, the Australopithecus afarensis specimen. What we can see is that we have multiple elements again preserved in these Malapa individuals, and it turns out they show a really surprising variation, not just in individual features, but in the combination of features they present. The site of Malapa, to the best of our knowledge at this point, appears to be dated to almost exactly 2 million years, or slightly younger than 2 million years. So it's very late in terms of the chronology of Australopithecus, perhaps one of the later Australopithecines. And it turns out this lateness also adds interesting complexity to how we understand it evolutionarily as a new species. Looking at these specimens, one of the initial things you could notice is that they're larger than earlier Australopithecines, such as Afarensis, but still quite small. Recall, Lucy herself is only about three and a half feet tall, so the Malapa individuals are also very small. And indeed, if we look at the cranial capacity of the better preserved MH1 specimen in its skull, we can see that it also has a very low cranial capacity towards the middle range of Australopithecines, but given its late time period, this suggests that it's actually quite a very small individual. Looking in at some of the features in more detail, here's a close-up of that MH1 skull, seen both anteriorly and also in an oblique view. There are a number of features of the Australopithecus sediba skull that appear to be very derived, indeed that look very derived relative to earlier Australopithecine evidence. Recall that throughout Australopithecine history, one of the things we see is an increasingly robust mascatory complex, bigger and bigger teeth. And indeed, after the midterm, we're going to talk about the truly hyper-robust Australopithecines, the robust Australopithecines. But what we have in Malapa is a very gracile individual. If we look, for example, at the zygomatics, if you look at the area of the temporal fossa on the side of the skull, if we look at the development of the temporal lines on the side of the skull, we can see a very small, reduced mascatory apparatus. This is an interesting difference, because this is one of the things we'll see in a couple weeks when we look at the origin of Homo that's very important. And yet we already seem to be seeing evidence of a reduced mascatory complex in Australopithecus sediba. Now, looking further at the skull, we can also see that there's very little facial prognathism. It's a fairly flat skull. There's a little bit of prognathism in the lower face, but not a huge amount, especially when compared to earlier Australopithecines. Again, this is a derived feature. Other aspects, however, appear more primitive and more Australopithecine-like. If we look at the nasal bones, for example, we see a very narrow superior portion with slight broadening as we go distally. This is something that we would associate with earlier Australopithecines and is a primitive characteristic. Likewise, if we look at the root of the zygomatic, where, in other words, the zygomatic takes root with the maxilla, we see that that's very low. Again, this is a characteristic of earlier Australopithecines and represents a primitive feature within this specimen. The pelvis of MH2, the second individual, has been reconstructed on the basis of the preserved morphology. And what we see in the pelvis of MH2 is actually something that appears to be very much in many ways like living humans. This is definitely the pelvis of a biped. We see again the large flaring ilium that's associated with the muscular attachments associated with bipedality. We see a broad opening for the birth canal, again suggesting that this would be possible to accommodate Australopithecine birth patterns. Although notice that there's an expanded pubis here relative to what we might think of as living humans. It turns out this appears to be characteristic of many early hominins in terms of their pelvic morphology.
If we compare this specimen, in fact, to a human, you can see that in addition to the reduced size, there's also a little bit of anterior-posterior constriction. This is again something that it turns out that we see in most early hominin pelvis that we have examined, this anterior-posterior narrowing of the birth canal, again potentially associated with constrained or constricted birth, and also reflecting the fact that hominin brain size at this time is not yet expanded. So there might not be quite as much pressure in terms of pelvic dimensions associated with birth. Um, but again, notice we see an overall pattern of morphology that looks very human-like in the reconstructions of the dimensions and shape of the pelvis. This is a very advanced derived pelvis, something that is in many ways very human-like. We also have a well-preserved hand and wrist from the Malapa II specimen, seen here. There's again a number of derived and interesting features in this hand. One of the things you might notice is that there's a very long thumb. It turns out this is a thumb that in many ways is similar to the thumb in your hand. One of the things we associate with the long thumb in our own hand is that it gives us great ability to manipulate objects. Having a powerful thumb opposing the fingers in our hand gives us tremendous both strength in our grip, but also the ability to create precision grip as well. The ability to manipulate objects both with force, but also with fine precision. This is something that we associate usually with the development of tool technology in humans, the development of an expanded strong thumb. Australopithecus sediba at about two million years of age doesn't at the moment at least appear to be associated with stone tools. Although again, we have evidence of stone tools going back at least two and a half million years. At about two million years of age, we don't yet believe that Australopithecus sediba is associated with stone tools. Although again, further excavations will help clarify this point. But recall that we have stone tools going back at least two and a half million years in the fossil record. So it's possible that stone tools are present. Also, we have evidence of Australopithecines earlier at sites in South Africa, potentially manipulating other kinds of tools. So it's possible that this derived thumb has something to do with tool use, although that's a question that remains to be answered by future excavations. Although the fingers of Malapa are elongated, especially the thumb, the hand itself remains quite gracile. This is a, these are very thin, small bones. And explaining this gracility is a question that still remains to be addressed. What exactly was the Malapa individual doing with its hand? Was it engaged in habitual tool making, tool use? Was it using its hand perhaps for some kind of locomotor activity? Moving forward, one of the curious things about Malapa, perhaps one of the most curious, is actually in its ankle. Here we see an image actually of a CT scan in the original specimen of the distal tibia, the talus, and what's preserved of the calcaneus. These are again the bones of the heel and ankle. The calcaneus in particular is interesting in terms of the primitive nature of it. When you think about the kind of bipedality that we talked about that Australopithecines have, it's very much like our own bipedal gait in the sense that it begins with a heel strike. We start off by placing our heel on the ground and roll forward. This means the heel receives a lot of force. One of the things that the human heel has to in order to adapt to this is that it's relatively broad. If we look at the base of the calcaneus, it's in humans, it's relatively flat and broad in order to accommodate that habitual striking of the heel on the ground. Interestingly, the calcaneus of Australopithecus sediba is very narrow in this respect. Not at all what you would expect to see in an individual that's an obligate biped. And remember that Australopithecus afarensis, three and a half million years of age, already has an expanded broad calcaneal tuber. The fact that Sediba appears to have a narrow one, one that's very much like a chimpanzee or other kind of great ape in terms of its morphology, raises significant questions about what kind of locomotor pattern exactly Sediba was doing. It also raises questions about where Sediba fits in in an evolutionary context. Is it a late derived Australopithecine? Or is it something that's moving on its way to becoming part of the genus Homo? Or is it an evolutionary dead-end side branch? Is it the result of further specialization in Australopithecines and the development of something that's totally peripheral to the main thrust of evolution? This is a question that remains to be addressed with future research.